Hi guys, Zach here. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash cinematary. This gives you access to over 180,000 titles for your iPhone, Android, and Kindle, as well as an MP3 player. Right now, I'm reading Space Odyssey, Stanley Kubrick, Arthur C. Clarke, and the making of a masterpiece by Michael Benson. But Audible users can also access other film books, such as Hank and Jim, The 50-Year Friendship of Henry Fonda and James Stewart by Scott Iman, or Five Came Back by Mark Harris. Again, the link to get your 30-day free trial is www.audibletrial.com slash cinematary. One more time, www.audibletrial.com slash cinematary. Now, on to the show. Welcome to episode 198 of Cinematary. I'm your host, Zach Dennis, and I am here with... Lydia Creech. Nathan Smith. And in today's episode, we will be talking about movies we saw this week in part one. And in part two, we will be joined by film critic, film historian, and author Scott Eyman to talk about 1946's My Darling Clementine. Uh, But before then, let's go ahead and jump into movies that we saw this week. And I'll kick us off with one new release and one not really new release, but one stuff, one that people should check out, you know, regardless. Uh, The first one is Solo, a Star Wars story this is the the latest in the star wars diluge that is coming out in theaters it's directed by ron howard it's written by the kasdans <laughs> and it tells you know it gives us what we've been craving for for years which is one a scene where we get to learn how han solo earned the name solo which is probably one of the most cringeworthy scenes Oof. I've experienced in a movie in a long time. Um, I, I heard a really good uh, example. <laughs> um, you know the part in uh, you know the part in in Straight Outta Compton when they ask Doctor when the, it's like late in the movie and they ask Doctor Dre something and he like re- he responds back with like the name of one of his albums. It's kind of like that because it's just like it's it's almost like he's looking at the camera like uh it's 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 awful it's a, it's a terrible it's a terrible scene. Regardless, um yeah the, the movie is pretty much Han Solo earning his name, meeting Chewbacca, meeting Lando Calrissian, and and getting being a part of this of this uh, little band of misfits is and we also get to watch the Kessel Run, which is you know another thing. That I don't know if people are really clamoring for. Uh, yeah. So that I, I, just a little backstory on this production. Uh, initially, this was going to be directed by Phil Lord and Chris Miller, who did uh, the Lego movie and 21 Jump Street and 22 Jump Street. Uh, but they were cut out deep into production and replaced by Ron Howard, who allegedly reshot 70% of this movie. Um, and I don't know. Ron Howard's a, he's fine. He's the definition of fine. Um, he's he's almost more frustrating than some directors because he's in that sphere of these just apolitical uh, things that direct stuff that's not that really has nothing to say about it. You know, it doesn't have anything to say about anything, and I, I guess that's perfect for this this story that really nobody cares about that much and we're questioning why it was being made and that's kind of is reflective of the of the box office return which was not as much as they were kind of hoping and there are moments in this that are entertaining uh there's a train heist sequence early in the film uh when han becomes in contact with uh woody harrelson's character who is this uh you know kind of older mentor type kind of like Han Solo but a little bit older and just like Woody Harrelson uh and it's a it's a really it's actually a very well choreographed uh well shot sequence you have this train barreling around this uh mountain and I think that Howard does a good job of kind of creating that problem solving slash action uh sequence pretty well and he's done that a number of times in in his films I think a really underrated 
uh, action film that he made. It's not really an action film, but there the, this, the racing sequences in it feel like action sequences, and those and that's the movie Rush from a couple of years ago with Chris Hemsworth and Daniel Bruhl. Uh, but here you have that sequence. You have you know characters like uh, Donald Glover playing Lando Calrissian who are who are fine. I think the the winning character of this entire thing is the droid that's voiced by Phoebe Waller Bridge, uh, who wrote and starred and and directed the uh, Amazon series Fleabag, which is a fantastic series if you haven't caught that. But she plays this droid named L3, who the entire uh, the entire movie is talking about the oppression of droids and how they need to have a droid rebellion. And at one point begins to like unshackle droids and let them free and there's like this whole uh <laughs> there's this whole droid uh uh escape that's that she instigates this kind of really it, it's like this weird it's it's like it's a very weird character to be throwing into this very uh uh standard star wars movie I, I was kind of a it was a nice change of pace but overall um i don't have much to say about solo it's 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 the story was already questionable kind of coming in and it doesn't do anything to really add to that uh there's nothing really too uh, memorable about the the movie i think it's just uh it's kind of it's kind of hitting that that um that level that marvel's kind of hit recently where they will release some is anyone surprised yeah no nobody's surprised um, but it's it's they've it's taken them what like four movies to hit that level that Marvel hit where they're just dropping stuff and people are kind of going eh. But I I, I saw I saw a good point also on the internet that I think one of the reasons people really didn't care about this movie is I think it's tough to sell a prequel anyway because you know like where the character goes like you know at the end of, it's not like he's gonna something's gonna happen to him in this movie and so it's not really that interesting to see the see the 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 what's happening before you actually caught up with him uh in movie form and were people begging for a han solo prequel nobody like, outside really? of the out of the disney boardroom quite honestly i mean i do feel like if you're gonna make a prequel about a star wars character um he does sort of demand a, a prequel more no, he doesn't. Well, more than the like other Star Wars characters. Like, you're not going to have a Luke Skywalker prequel, you know. What about that's a Leia prequel? Him. That's true. That's because... that, but I think the thing, though, the thing about it is, is it's sort of like it's like on one hand, like oh, it would make sense because he obviously has this like past, and we don't really know a lot about his past. So there's stuff you can play around with. But also, I feel like the sort of like mystique of Han Solo is sort of quintessential to right, that's the character and to how Harrison Ford plays him of he's sort of rough and you get these little hints about his life but he's just I like guess a man sort of with no the, name yeah it's like it but it points to the problem with all these movies and not just Star Wars movies but it's like you know there's there's no there's no mystique if everything is explained and everything has a prequel and a backstory then there's nothing left to the imagination and there's no um you know, it's like, I, I mean, this goes into the discussion sort of we have about uh, my darling Clementine in the second half, but it's like, imagine if somebody were like, let's make a Doc Holiday prequel and let's just like totally disrobe all of the sort of uh, mysteriousness that Victor Mature brings to the role of Doc Holiday and my darling Clementine. It's like, why? Why do you need that? You that don't. would 100% have been something that would have happened if My Darling Clementine came out like <laughs> in the past five years yeah. and was successful. They would have been like, all right, we got to have the Doc Holiday. We got to have the, uh, the Chihuahua prequel. <laughs> we got to have the Wyatt Earp in, in Dodge City movie. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's very true. No, I, 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 I can't disagree with you. It's, 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 it's true. Like, I guess you could have made something that was interesting about Han Solo, but this one just it kind of just felt like it was really even more than um force awakens or rogue one was just really servicing the fans and giving them those Ugh. winky mm-hmm. moments that they can not uh, wink at the screen and go ah oh, you caught that reference and um 
I don't know, that, that's just not, that's not good storytelling. I know that it's satisfying for the people who, who uh, enjoy, enjoy the character and enjoy Star Wars movies, but that, I don't think that's a good storytelling, and I think that you're going to come away with a much richer experience if you have an interesting narrative behind it. Um, I don't know. It made me, it, it, it continued to make me appreciate The Last Jedi a lot more. I think that that's a really, kind of weirdly an underrated movie. But, you know, that's just me. Um, Solo, Star Wars movie, Star Wars story, whatever the hell it is. It's, it's in theaters now. Um, the other movie I watched this week was uh, one of Steven Soderbergh's films, Out of Sight, from 1998. And it stars Jennifer Lopez and George Clooney at the height of their hotness. And uh, Clooney stars as this career bank robber who breaks out of jail. But on his, on his you know break out of jail, he... Uh, runs into Jennifer Lopez, who is a is a federal marshal, and he and his and his companion Ving Rhames uh, kidnap her, and they get to talking. And for the uh, for the rest of the movie, it's it's pretty much uh, Jennifer Lopez is trying to track down George Clooney's bank robber character as he plans this last big job. Uh, they're, as they plan to rob this this incredibly rich banker played by Albert Brooks, who they met while in in jail a couple years ago, and uh, I I've, I've been really into to Soderbergh lately, especially his his sleek heist movies. I I really really enjoyed Logan Lucky last year, um, and I'm kind of excited to go back and rewatch his Oceans trilogy before uh, Gary Ross does whatever the hell he's going to do with this new one, which is very sad. I kind of wish Steven Soderbergh was, was directing it. But this one is is very, it's a very punchy, very, very sleek, very, uh, very, now I wouldn't say fast moving. It, it, it moves at kind of its own pace, its own rhythm. It has this very... Um, sensual sexy uh somewhat dreamlike rhythm to it you have these scenes uh where jennifer lopez and george clooney are meet up and are inter- interacting with each other and you're not really sure if it's a if it's a dream sequence or if it's happening in, in reality and uh i think that i don't know clooney, clooney is 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 you know doing his best george clooney uh, ness in this, uh, I think Jennifer Lopez is is very is very very entertaining, very f- funny in her uh, kind of sh- straight man role to his more absurd uh, cool guy persona. I think that the uh, you, you have these wonderfully nice supporting roles for for Ving Rhames and Steve Zahn and Don Cheadle. Um, and as well as Albert Brooks, uh, and I don't know. It's it's a like I, it, I'm just repeating myself, but it's a very sleek, it's a very sexy uh, heist movie that I don't know. I feel like went went under the cracks a little bit. Uh, it's it's edited by Annie Coates, who just recently passed away, and mm. it, this is why it kind of caught my attention because um, a lot of people were, of course, going, yeah, she, you know, Lawrence of Arabia is fantastic, but. Uh, a little one of her more underrated works is out of sight and it's true it she, she, the way that she will edit scenes uh the a lot of the first part of this movie takes place in south florida and it kind of feels like you know it's so hot and it, it almost feels like you can you can see that in the editing she does these these kind of uh these very slow cross dissolves that it seems like the the two images are melting together uh because of the of the summer heat uh as well as just the the sexual tension between Clooney and and Lopez uh she she also uses these kind of quick back and forth uh shot reverse shots that you're used to seeing in in you know just really any general romantic comedy or, or romance of any of any sort but 
she the way that she kind of the rhythm that she uses the way that she she cuts back and forth really uh works along with the cadence of their of the of their speech as they're kind of you know going having rapport back uh, back and forth between each other uh it, it was one it was something that of course i was looking for because it, it's what kind of brought me to watching the movie but at the end of the day i also really uh was really struck with just how it's it's how subtle but how evocative the the editing was editing was in in the film so if you can check out out of sight i recommend it it's a really fun really fun really fun little movie there steven soderbergh <laughs> he's doing things so that's all yeah uh nathan you had two movies though for us yes i do have two uh comedies to talk about um the first is a 1978 film from Claudia Weil called Girlfriends. Um, it is about two uh, girls who are friends. Uh, they are roommates in New York City, um, played by Melanie Myron and Anita Skinner. Um, I was doing a little bit of uh, reading about the movie before talking about it. And Melanie Myron, who plays the lead um, character named Susan Weinblatt, is probably most known um, for her role on the show 30-something. But also, apparently, she's a director and uh, directed Mean Girls 2. Um, so just a, a little fun <laughs> fact for you. Um, so this movie also stars Christopher Guest and, and Bob Balaban in, in two really funny uh, early roles for those for those actors. Um, so it's a very it's a very New York City movie. It's a, you know like I said, these two girls are roommates. They're they're kind of trying to get ahead, working jobs. The main character Susan is a photographer, but she mostly just gets jobs um, shooting bar mitzvahs and, and birthday parties and things like that. But she's trying to become a professional and an artist. Um, but her roommate uh, gets married to a man played by Bob Balaban. Um, and and it moves out and moves in with him and and gets pregnant and does the whole you know uh, marriage grown up adult stay at home thing um, and so they sort of start to to split apart and to go their separate ways and some kind of tension develops between them since they've gone on very different paths in their lives. Um, Susan uh, uh, picks up a hitchhiker and the hitchhiker ends up staying with her and there are a lot of hijinks that ensue. Um, she starts dating a guy played by a young Christopher Guest. Um, it's a very kind of uh, sort of leisurely paced film, um, you know, not really high stakes by any means, um, but 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 very funny. Um, Claudia Wall is an, an interesting director. Um, she mostly she started in documentary actually, um, and apparently started one of her first jobs was doing a lot of the like short segments that uh, played on Sesame Street, not the main show, but in the little like kind of almost uh, experimental sort of episodes that like teach you numbers and colors and stuff. Um, and then she did a documentary film called The Other Half of the Sky, uh, which was co-directed with Shirley MacLaine actually. Um, and is this documentary about, about women in uh, the People's Republic of China. Um, so there is this sort of like kind of scrappy documentary quality to this movie. I mean, I think it's a very uh, accurate portrayal of, of life in New York in the late 1970s of what it would have been like to be kind of a young Jewish woman navigating the city, um, navigating a career in, in the arts and the creative industries. Um, so it is, you know, this sort of small um, independent film um, that really didn't gain a lot of traction when it was released. It was sold to uh, Warner Brothers, I believe, and produced independently. But actually... Um, apparently, in my little research that I did before we started talking, um, there's actually a, a, a quote from Stanley Kubrick, who in 1980 in an interview mentioned that he was a big fan of the film. Um, that uh, I'll just read his quote really quickly. Um, the interviewer asks him, you know, what he thinks about sort of like New Hollywood and people like Coppola and, and De Palma and what they were doing. And his response was, I think one of the most interesting Hollywood or American films that I've seen in a long time is Claudia Weil's Girlfriends. That film I thought was one of the very rare American films that I would compare with the serious, intelligent, sensitive writing and filmmaking that you find in the best directors in Europe. It wasn't a success. I don't know why it should have been. Certainly, I thought it was a wonderful film. It seemed to make no compromise to the inner truth of the story, you know, the theme and everything else. Um, 
So after this movie, Claudia Weil had a little bit of a career in Hollywood. She did a movie called It's My Turn with Michael Douglas, but has mostly worked in um, television since. She's directed episodes of Girls and uh, uh, Jane the Virgin and a lot of shows um, over the past few decades. And that's sort of where she's ended up. Uh, but this movie has had a really interesting afterlife, I think. It was a, a big influence on uh, Lena Dunham and also on uh, Francis Ha, which I think you can really see in those movies. I mean, being about, or, or the, those movies and TV shows being about, um, you know, young women in New York, I think there's very much sort of a similarity and a, and a kinship. Um, but I think, I honestly, I think Girlfriends is uh, better than either the works of Lena Dunham or Francis Ha, even though I do think that Francis Ha is a very good movie. Um, I don't know, there's just like a very, a warmth and an honesty and a humor to this movie that is just like so, so good and, and so refreshing. Um, and it seems to be having kind of this like moment of resurgence. I saw it in uh, at, at this series of, of uh, films by women filmmakers from roughly the new Hollywood period of the 70s and 80s that played at um, the Brooklyn Academy of Music's theater um, just a few weeks ago in New York. And it was a sold out screening um, and it's been playing a lot over the past few years in New York, and I think a lot of people are really trying to push this movie um, in the same way that I think the films of, of Elaine May have experienced a revival um, that they, you know, and have been getting attention that they didn't get at the time. I think this movie has is experiencing something similar, um, and it's on. It's available on on a DVD that Warner put out. Um, I mean, it's not you know the best quality ever or anything like that. I'm sure it's a movie that will get restored at some point. But it is just like a very, it's a really lovely movie. It's its um, small and it's modest, but I think it speaks much, um, uh, speaks beyond its, you know, it's kind of small, intimate scope. Um, it's a really touching movie. Um, yeah, I don't have much to say about it. I feel like I'm kind of repeating the same adjectives over and over again, but uh, I definitely recommend checking it out if you can, if you can find it. Um, is it streaming anywhere? I don't think it is, but but like I said, it's available on DVD, so uh, it's you, you know you should be able to find it. Um, you find it out there somewhere. Yeah, oh, your local, local library, library is always maybe. a good good resource. Um, I know this. Is, My local library has a shitty <laughs> spread, though. So oh, that's so mean. <laughs> Calling you out. I'm sorry. This no. is this is definitely a movie. We lost all of our local library. <laughs> this is definitely one of those movies that I, you know, I watched and I was like, I know a thousand people, both, you know, hardcore cinephiles and, and more casual viewers who would absolutely adore this movie. Um, so definitely I recommend it. Um, the other comedy I have to talk about is an equally a, a Jewish <laughs> movie, uh, but very different uh, and from a very different personality uh it is the 2011 movie jack and jill um directed by dennis dugan starring adam sandler in a dual role as a as a pair of twins uh, one male one female named jack and jill um this movie has uh like a lot of sandler's movies has a sort of outsized reputation that i don't think is entirely fair and and before i go any further i want to give a brief shout out to uh to our good friend uh, David Allen, devoted listener of the podcast, who has taken issue with uh, some my defenses of uh, low cultural uh, objects in the past. So, David, <laughs> you might want to skip this, or maybe not. You know, maybe uh, you will be tempted to uh, to to check this movie out, and and you will find that it is different than uh, you you think. Um, but in, but anyways, Jack and Jill was uh, actually playing in New York, a uh, thirty five millimeter print. Um, because this movie came out in that sort of weird transitional period where digital had, you know, kind of mostly taken over in terms of projection, but not entirely. Um, so studios were still making prints for exhibition purposes. Um, and, but the movie was shot digitally. Um, so I do think it's sort of interesting to see that kind of interplay between the film projection and the, and the digital image, even though it's not like the most, you know, beautifully shot or composed movie by any means. Um, was this one of his uh, Netflix movies? No, this was this was uh, before that. Uh, I think oh, okay. like I think the first Netflix one was maybe 2014 or 2015. Um, but you know, sort of the the tail end of the theatrical releases, and I think maybe part of the reason why he he switched to Netflix is because of uh, 
sort of the the response that this movie got, even though it did fine at the box office. Um, a lot of people, you know, it shows up on those lists of the worst movies ever made, and and it, we could won a bunch of Razzie awards, of course. Um, but I really, I don't know. I just really don't think this movie is that bad. I mean, you know, you don't have to enjoy it, but it's it's not like the worst thing ever made. I mean, it's so it's about these two twins, Jack and Jill Sadelstein. Uh, Jack is an ad executive in Los Angeles, and his embarrassing sister Jill still lives at at home in uh, New York and the Bronx. Um, and, you know, Jack is this advertising whiz. He's really successful. He has a big house, a beautiful family. Um, but but Jill is, is very obnoxious, um, very uh, m- messy. She has lived with their mother who just passed away. Um, you know, everybody sort of uh, struggles to, to, to put up with her. Um, and you and you know that they don't have a really good relationship, um, but she's coming to visit for Thanksgiving, and Jack is very worried that she's gonna uh, outstay her welcome and and cling to him um, because she has always um, invested a lot in their relationship and and really loved him, but he has been more distant um, and and sort of withdrawn himself from their twinship. Um, but. Uh, when when uh, she visits, a series of incidents happen, which um, lead them to meet Al Pacino. Um, Jack uh, is working on this commercial for Dunkin' Donuts, and Dunkin' Donuts has introduced this drink called Dunkachino, and they really want Al Pacino mm. for the commercial. So Jack is trying <laughs> to woo Al Pacino, and Al Pacino falls head over heels for Jill. Um, he says, you know, you're from the Bronx. I'm from the Bronx. When I look at you, I see home. It takes me back to my roots. Nobody understands me in Los Angeles. You know, he's uh, Al Pacino is uh, playing in King Lear. He has this breakdown that goes viral. He's sort of on the outs. But Jill, he feels, is the woman to get him back where he needs to be, um, even though everybody else is just shocked that, you know, this this great actor would, would fall for someone like that. Um, he is just absolutely adores her. So Al Pacino agrees to um, do the commercial if if Jack will set him up with Jill. Jill doesn't want to be set up with Al Pacino. Um, so a lot of a lot of hijinks ensue, and uh, there's a lot of you know fart jokes and poop jokes and all those great things. Um, I think like the the probably the most famous scene from this movie, which even if you don't want to watch the movie, I think is genuinely very funny, and you should uh, watch it. Is the Dunkachino commercial, um, which is just like absolutely nuts. Uh, I mean, it's not a surprise that this movie has a lot of product placement in it. Uh, as I just said, you know, Dunkin' Donuts plays a major uh, kind of point in the plot. Um, but I don't know. It's like at its heart, it's 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 honestly kind of a sweet movie about this uh you know relationship between a a brother and sister who come closer together and i'm kind of a sentimental sucker at heart so i i'm always uh drawn in i guess by these sort of like weird which sandler does this a lot this like weird combination of the sort of sentimental family um drama with these just like very disgusting gags um just that sort of like the cognitive dissonance that comes from putting those two things together is very appealing to me as somebody who is very easily emotionally manipulated and as somebody who has the sense of humor as a 12 of a 12 year old and thinks that like jokes about diarrhea are hilarious uh i i'm sort of like the target audience for this movie unfortunately um and I, I think there's like an interesting sort of uh, reading that you could do of this movie. Um, my my good friend Adam Katzman has talked about to me how how uh, he feels like this movie is sort of almost like Adam Sandler sort of reckoning with his Jewishness. Um, Jill is like much more um, sort of appears much more Jewish than him and has a harder time assimilating into kind of dominant white culture. Whereas Jack has been successful and has sort of done that. So she is this sort of constant embarrassment to him. So it's sort of this like 
feature length negotiation of Adam Sandler's ethnic identity um, and his sort of place in American society, which a lot of his movies have that sort of discourse running through them that I think you can read. I'm maybe not the person to do those readings, but I think there are those things there and they are, uh, I don't know, they're all, they're, it's really interesting um, that sort of uh, like the, the tradition of, I guess, like vulgar, of vulgar Jewish humor is, is of interest to me. Um, so yeah, it's like, it's, it's even if you want to hate watch it, I think it's like genuinely a pretty fun movie. Al Pacino is just <laughs> ridiculous in it. Um, and, you know, uh, doing, doing something that, uh, he's at, he, I think he's very talented at, I mean, even in a movie like Heat, uh, you know, which is such a serious movie, Al Pacino has some like insane moments of, of like over the top, uh, comedic bits in that in that film so i think he's he's almost sort of suited for for comedy in a way even if we may not it may not be what we associate him with um and i don't know i i don't don't really know what else to say about this movie other than that i liked it other people may not other people may think it's the worst thing ever made and even if you don't like it i'm just like why is this the like the worst movie of all time like why this like in terms of Adam Sandler's mo- movies, it's like not the most offensive. Um, you know, that has some stuff in there that may not. What's sit. the most offensive? I don't even know. Um, probably like the Ridiculous <laughs> Six or something. Um, That's but fair. It, you know, it's like you know, there's some thing, jokes that aren't going to appeal to people that aren't going to sit well with people. But I do think, and there's some jokes that like definitely don't work. I don't think it's a masterpiece by any means. It's not what I'm saying. It's you know, but it's. It's fun. It's funny. There's like this great gag um, with this old woman who looks very weird. Um, there's there's a that's the gag. I don't know. It's just like it's it's hard to explain. <laughs> I can't explain it. But they go to this party and there's just this like one old woman with these weird teeth just like staring <laughs> at Jill and she keeps getting hit in the head with like soccer balls and like. Her body is just this like oh. rag doll just flying around and you know, she's this old woman. I'm just like imagining that pitch meeting was like, all right, so we're gonna put an old lady who looks weird in the party. Well, what is she doing? She just looks weird. <laughs> well that's right. the, that's okay, the thing right. I wonder about like a movie like this is like imagine getting up in the your job is just editing this movie and watching these insane sequences over and over again. Like that's just I don't know, bonkers to me that you know, people make these like disgusting things um and you just have to sit with that and then you have to go home and talk to your kids and your wife and... <laughs> exactly <laughs> daddy what did you do at work today <laughs> oh my god son i can't i can't there was this old, ugly old lady at a party and i had to edit it together and adam sandler was dressed up as a woman and al pacino was making out with them and i don't know what to tell the you there's also it. a uh, really great bit with uh, adam sandler's son in this movie where he just like has the, uh, this habitual need to his real son no 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 the 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 son in his movie not his real son uh but has this just like habitual <laughs> need to tape things to himself and so through as the movie goes on he's just like taping more and more ridiculous things to his body and actually i think th- like his son gets some of the funniest lines um in the movie he's just you know one of those like cute little kids who you think's not going to say anything nasty and then he says stuff that is just like uh that's just really funny. Good delivery. Um, I, anyways, I feel like I've talked too much about this movie and haven't really said much, but <laughs> I don't know. Give it a chance. It's not that bad. It's really not that bad. It's not. Shining endorsement. That's my. That's kind of my whole pitch for, for Sandler. Like, it's just really not that bad. Like, it's not that bad. It's not. There are way, <laughs> there are way worse things. You know, there are things that you should genuinely get mad at. And this is just kind of harmless, whatever. Like, I don't know. At the end of the day, I can't fault Sandler that much, even if his movies don't always work, because he's just kind of like hanging out with his friends. They're having a good time. He wants to give his friends jobs. Yeah, he's you know, they're all getting paid. They're all having a vacation. The movies aren't like insanely you know, budgeted in terms of Hollywood, especially the Netflix ones, they've been getting kind of smaller and smaller in scope, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, And they're just these like little movies, you know, they're just there. Anyways. 
Yeah, this movie's out there. It's you know pretty easy to find. Adam yeah. Sandler, they're just there. All right, uh, we're gonna take a short break. We'll be back uh, with Scott Iman to talk about My Darling Clementine after this. Hey, Cinematariots. This is your co-host, Lydia Creech, with an important message during this break in the show. Cinematary would like you to know that we do not want your money, and we don't want to place ads in the show at this time either. That's not why we do this. We do it because we enjoy each other's company, and we want to bring you our pure, unadulterated opinions on the world of cinema. However, there are a few things you can do to help out the show that we would greatly appreciate. First, leave us a review on iTunes, four or five stars only. to help us reach more listeners per the algorithm gods. Secondly, send us a tweet at Cinematary, or better yet, send us an email at Zach at Cinematary.com. That's Zach, Z-A-C-H, so we can hear from you guys for a change. I'd especially like to hear if you're a human and not an android who also likes Blade Runner, or maybe you have a suggestion of a movie you would really like to hear our opinions on. Regardless, let us know your thoughts and we will read them out and respond to them on future episodes of the show. Finally, please share the show with friends and members of your family who you think would enjoy listening to and participating in our film discussions that we bring to you guys every week. So, to recap, review, send us your thoughts through Twitter and email, and please share with your friends and family. We would greatly appreciate it. Thanks for listening. Now back to the show. Shoes were number nine Herring boxes without topsis Sandals were for Clementine Oh my darling, oh my darling And we are back with part two of episode 198 of Cinematary. In this part, we will be continuing our Young Critics Watch old movie series with 1946's My Darling Clementine. Uh, But joining us today from lovely West Palm Beach, he's not with the president, but he's, you know, there in spirit. Uh, Mr. Scott Iman, thank you so much for coming on the podcast with us. Thanks, Jack. Uh, So we're going to talk about My Darling Clementine. This is a John Ford film. Uh, Like I said, it came out in 1946. And really the synopsis is uh, the the Earp brothers, led by Wyatt Earp, played by Henry Fonda, are on on the middle of a long cattle drive, and they stop for the night in the town of Tombstone. The next morning they find their cattle stolen and one of the brothers dead. And so he suspects this family who owned the OK Corral to be the culprits, but he wants his revenge to be legal, so he becomes becomes the marshal of Tombstone with his two brothers as deputies and uh, along the way has to forge peace with the alcoholic gambler Doc Holliday uh, and of course comes into contact with Holliday's former girlfriend Clementine uh, along the way but you know Sc- Scott I, I kind of wanted to start with by talking about John Ford I, your your book Print the Legend the Life and Times of John Ford is is, is really I feel like the 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 go-to book if you want to learn about the director and it seemed like at this point in his career he was aiming for a little bit more studio control you know it was it was after the war and he had already done a number of hits up to that point um do you, did you feel like that kind of oops, entered the way he approached this film you know compared to others he you know he wanted a little bit more autonomy or was it just he was interested in this narrative I was, it was an autonomous film that filmed and very clean and generally came in on or under budget they tended to leave him alone the producers tended to leave him alone and they also tended to leave him alone because everybody was a little scared of him as they should have been because he could be really unpleasant and cutting when he chose to be so because of all these factors, people tended to give him a wide berth, uh, both as a function of professional respect and because of his temperament. Um, after the, during the war, he'd run his own unit uh, connected to the Navy, the Field Photo Service, which was in charge of all reconnaissance photography of the Navy, which is a big job, as you can imagine. 
Uh, and he had 120 guys or so under his direct command. Uh, and was in charge, you know, it, it was a big operation. And and with the ending of the war, uh, he, he, it was kind of hard for him to uh, to imagine going back to a kind of passive, reactive uh, uh, way of being a, a director in the studio system in Hollywood when you were given a script and told, said to, and here's your cast and here's your cameraman, go make your movie, you know, uh, which was not really the way he worked anyway. But there was enough. There was enough of that around the edges to cause him to say, "No, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to be my own guy." So after the war, he formed uh, Argosy Productions with his friend Marion Cooper, uh, going to independent production, as a lot of people did. George Stevens went into independent production. Weiler went into independent production. Frank Capra did. A bunch of people went into independent production, and they almost all crashed and burned. Uh, Ford didn't quite crash and burn. He managed to keep the plane aloft uh, until 1952 with the quiet man, which paid off all the debts <laughs> of, of Argosy production. Uh, but they basically just at that point, they realizing they had actually made some money. Finally, after, after seven or eight years, they decided to, uh, to close down and take their, uh, take the profits they'd made off the quiet man and, and, and call it a day. Uh, but even after that, he he basically served as his own producer uh, for films like uh, the the Searchers and those. Yeah, it's it seemed like uh, just rereading through the book that uh, it kind of was he was still doing a little bit of that one for me, one for you. It seemed like he was still working within the studio system, but the output in terms of what he was doing for the studio system was a little bit lesser than what he was doing on his own terms. You know, he I guess he was he was putting more effort into The Quiet Man and My Darling Clementine than something, you know, some of the other, you know, Westerns that people can't name off the top of their heads that he was doing for the studios. Sure, 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 sure. Well, he owed Daryl Zanuck a movie. That was my darling Clementine. He had a picture left on his contract that was put in uh, cold storage when he went off to war. So he comes back to Hollywood in 1945 and he does, they were expendable because that was a special film that the, that both MGM and the Navy wanted made. So Zanuck sat still uh, for another six months while Ford went off and shot and cut. They were expendable for MGM. And then he still owes Zanuck a picture, and that became My Darling Clementine. Kind of kind of looking at the process of making this movie, it seemed like, uh, I really like the anecdotes about his writing process, especially with Winston Miller, who wrote My Darling Clementine. Uh, and it seemed very quintessential to the director and his personality. And it seemed, you know, he would be, they would be doing stuff, and then Miller would say one line that would kind of get at Ford, and Ford would, you know, erupt into some into some rant. Um, you mentioned in the book, though, that Miller didn't really have any credits, uh, writing credits at least, a prior he had very minor he had very minor credits yeah. very minor he'd been an actor in the silent a kid actor he'd worked for ford as an at kid actor in the iron horse uh, in 1924 so that i suspect was why ford took him on to write my darling clementine because his screen credits i think he had a serial and one or two pictures at fox a horse picture at fox uh you know boy and his horse kind of thing uh, but at home, or, you know, some very minor credits, nothing to, uh, qualify him to work on a John Ford Western, but Ford didn't care. You know, I, he, he was much more interested in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, relationships than he was in hiring necessarily the most superb screenwriter he could find because he figured it was based on the set. It was going to be between him and the actors anyway. And the script may, the script might get used. The script might be, the dialogue might not get used. You know, he was, he was uh, not tied to a script. And that, it seemed like that was the, uh, the understanding that Sam a Angle had whenever he was, you know, on the set and was just kind of like, I would prefer, you know, a writing credit rather than a producing credit because John Ford's the producer in the movie. And everybody knows he, he runs the picture himself, sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, it's just, um, I mean, other than, you know, previously working for him, I mean, was there, I, I guess he just had the, the, the four weeks of, of kind of hanging out with Miller and, and shooting out story ideas was kind of what made him go, yeah, let's let him write this thing. It, it really wasn't, hey, I think that this kid has something. It's more he just had, he understood that what Ford wanted to do with the movie. The whole sequence of events at Tombstone, Arizona had, uh, had, had been he entered into history uh, almost immediately after it happened in 1880, what, three, 82, 83. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, they were kind of working with familiar territory. Um, 
Now, I mentioned before that, that Henry Fonda stars in this film. Uh, you know, it's, it's of, of course, whenever you think of a John Ford film, I think you usually go to John Wayne. Uh, as someone who has read about Fonda, Wayne, and Ford, um, I, what about Fonda made him perfect for the role of, of Wyatt Earp instead of, you know, some of his other staple actors? Mm, stillness. Fonda was a still, had a, a quality of stillness as an actor in a real quiet center. Uh, whereas John Wayne is always churning. You know, he's very emotionally raw. Even when he's playing a fairly passive character like uh, Nathan Brittles in She Wore Yellow Ribbon, he's always chafing about something, you know, uh, which was an authentic uh, projection of, of uh, aspects of Wayne's personality. He was very alive. He was lively. He was a very lively guy and alert and always on point. Uh, and F- whereas Fonda could go a couple of days without saying anything to anybody, you know, he was very quiet and very withdrawn. And as an actor, he's a minimalist. And I think Ford simply thought he was a much better, uh, uh, he was much more closely related to Wyatt Earp than John Wayne would have been because Earp was, Earp was a very cold character by, 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 uh, by character it is by nature. He just, he, uh, in spite of all the gunfights he was in and everything that happened in his life, he never got a scratch. You know, he was never wounded. Nothing bad ever happened to him except losing money because he was a gambler. And so, of course, like most gamblers, he died broke. Uh, and he never had much money. But uh, in terms of uh, handling a gun, in terms of gunfights, in terms of confrontations and violence, uh, he led a charmed life. So Ford keyed on that, on that quality of, of coldness in her, and, uh, and uh, the, the, the nearest corollary was Henry Fonda. Scott, I wanted to ask you, um, every time that I've seen this film, I've actually been more struck by uh, Victor Mature's performance than Henry Fonda's, even though I think Henry Fonda is great in it. I think that, for me, Victor Mature is really sort of the standout performer. And I was wondering just what you think he sort of brings to the role and like what what makes that performance uh, as Doc Holliday so distinctive? Well, Doc Holliday's the better part, for one thing. Every <laughs> actor that's, every actor that's, that's played Doc Holliday steals the picture from whatever actor plays wider. I mean, my God, in Tombstone, Val Kilmer kills as Doc Holliday. And I mean, nobody ever thinks Val Kilmer is you know, any, any drop-dead great actor. But it's a great part. Val, Doc Holliday is a spectacular part for an actor. He's, he's, he's a drunk. He's dying. Uh, and he's willing to, he, and he's willing to sacrifice his life for his best friend who he sometimes doesn't like very much. <laughs> so you've got all these dynamic uh, elements in the character. So it's hard for an actor to suck at playing Doc Holliday. Actually. <laughs> Mature is very good. Mature is very good because he gets the self-loathing. He gets the thwarted ambitions. And there's that wonderful scene where he recites Shakespeare in the barn. Mm-hmm. And Fonda's looking at him, giving him side eye, watching him, you know, and like he's out of character wondering if Mature is going to get through the scene, get through the dialogue, because it's not like Victor Mature ever went around reciting Shakespeare. <laughs> and he's very and, and he's very good. You know, he's really very good in the part. Uh, but he, he, but it's a great part. You have to separate the performance from the part. Right. Much, no, Victor Mature never thought he was much as an act, much of an actor. He was very good when he was cast correctly and when he was directed by someone that he respected. He's very good for Ford. He's very good for Henry Hathaway in Kiss of Death. Uh, He's good playing anxiety for a guy who doesn't particularly project anxiety on his own. You know, he's not a nervous actor, particularly, Mm -hmm. but psych, but he, he can, he was good at projecting conflict, internal conflict which is all the essence of Doc Holliday. It seems also like he kind of, um, Doc has to have some sort of, you know, legendary presence. Even even though you have Wyatt Earp in this, in, in the whole OK Canal, uh, Corral uh, scene in this, I feel like uh, he... I like OK Canal. I think that's an interesting <laughs> way of looking at the OK Canal. The OK <laughs> Canal, that, that's the sequel. <laughs> Gunfight at the OK Canal, right, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I feel like you, you have to have some, you know, some bravado whenever you're, you're also taking on that role. And it seemed like the movie star quality of Victor Mature kind of helped to to you know have that have that quality it, it seemed like he he felt like he felt like a larger than life presence in that city he is and also he's sexy 
Mature is a sexy act. He's very sensual. He's kind mm-hmm. of big and beefy and muscular, and he's uh, he's got a sensual Italian. He was Italian, and he looks like a sensual Italian guy, which is what he was. And that works because there, there is no sensuality particularly. It's not a sensual picture by, by and large. But because Mature has that quality, because Linda Darnell had that quality, you've got this undercurrent going of, of, uh, of, of kind of illicit sensuality that I think works for the picture. Because as far as Wyatt is concerned, he's on a, he's on, he just wants to kill the guys that killed his brother. Uh, and Fonda plays him pretty monochromatically. You know, Fonda's, Fonda's part does not have a lot of shading to it. The only shading he has is his attraction to Clementine. The rest of the picture, he's very focused. He doesn't even, he's not that interested in being the sheriff of Tombstone. He's interested in getting the guys that killed his brother. The, 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 the sheriff's thing is a vehicle for him to get to the, the guys mm-hmm. that killed his brother. I, that that's kind of leads me to one of the other questions I had is, of, of course, uh, Wyatt Earp is, is somebody who has been played over and over again in, in pop culture and movies. Um, and it, it, it's kind of interesting because Ford, you know, actually knew Wyatt Earp. And I, I, I saw in the book that he talked um, he talked about how he or he bragged to Peter Bogdanovich about how he got like the most correct version of of this tale. Um, I mean, do you believe that to be true, you know, compared to some of the other interpretations of the story? That's utter. It's utter bullshit. It's utter bullshit. <laughs> now, he he probably did know uh, Wyatt Earp. Wyatt Earp, the, the connection would have been Tom Mix. Tom Mix was a pallbearer at Wyatt Earp's funeral. They were that close. Wyatt Earp hung around Hollywood for years in the hopes that someone would pay him to make a movie about his life. And nobody ever did while he was alive. As soon as he was, as soon as he was dead, they jumped on it. Uh, and I think the first Earp movie came out uh, like two years later, uh, Walter Houston and Law and Order, where he's clearly playing Wyatt Earp, even though they don't call him Wyatt Earp. Even everything in the film is based on the Wyatt Earp uh, myth. Uh, but they never paid him while he was alive, which is why he died broke. Um, but Mix and he were quite close. And Ford had directed Mix on a couple of pictures in the 20s, and they were good friends. Uh, when Mix died in 1940, Ford got him, uh, uh, made some phone calls, and got him buried in a military cemetery, even though Mix had deserted in the Army during the Spanish-American War. And the Army tends to look askance at that kind of thing. But... <laughs> But uh, uh, Ford pulled some strings because he had a lot of connections in the military because of his service during World War II. And he got he got uh, a mix uh, buried in a military cemetery with honors. Um, so the connection would have been mixed. Uh, and Ford did say that he, he knew her, uh, which is probably true, although there's no independent confirmation of it. I mean, there's no letters from Herb to Ford in the Ford's in Ford's papers. But I think we can assume they probably would have met at some point because of the proximity of uh, the two people in Hollywood in the 1920s. Um, that said, the, the, the uh, Ford's portrayal of the gunfight at the OK Corral is completely false and made up. For one thing, Doc Holliday doesn't, didn't die at the gunfight at the OK Corral. Doc Holliday died years late, a couple of years later of uh, tuberculosis in Colorado. Uh, among other things, and also the, the, the choreography is all wrong. The most accurate, the most accurate representation of the gunfight at the Oak Hill is in Tombstone, which is very much, it's very, very close to the historical record of what happened. You know, it was like 20 seconds. The gunfight at the Oak Hill took 20 or 30 seconds. That's all. It was over very quickly. It wasn't any, it wasn't any uh, military operation. Uh, but Ford, you know, Ford could, uh, could sling the bowl with it with the best of them. And so you, you, he would start talking and, you know, there'd be two sentences of verifiable fact and then he'd go off, you know, in, <laughs> under some pure, purely subjective uh, fantasia that had no relation to objective reality because he was a storyteller. All those guys were storytellers, you know, and, and, and the most important thing is, uh, is drama to a storyteller. And tension and dramatic tension. So, but no, the the uh, the gunfight in My Darling Clementine has no relation to what actually happened. How does it? How does uh, My Darling Clementine compare for you to the other uh, interpretations of the Wyatt Earp story? I like it because it feels like it's made by one of its own characters. Uh, it's very sparse. He sets up the plot very quickly in uh, um, six or eight minutes, really the opening of the picture, you know exactly who the good guys are, you know exactly who the bad guys are, and you know what the dramatic conflict is, and then he drops all of it. 
for like four reasons <laughs> of character, you know, and, and a half hour goes by and basically you've forgotten all of, almost completely forgotten about, uh, uh, the Clantons and Doc and, uh, 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 wider, you know, because it becomes, the movie becomes about tombstone and it mm-hmm. becomes about Earp and, uh, uh, Doc Holliday, and then you bring in Granville Thorndike, the eminent tragedian. <laughs> you know, all these wonderful characters come wafting through the movie, uh, which is kind of typical of Ford. He does that. He would he would he would do that, especially in the latter stages of his career. He would set things up very quickly, and then he'd back away from the plot and go directly to character for half an hour or longer. He does that in The Quiet Man too, mm-hmm. where you know he, he, does, he withholds the secret about Sean Thornton. Uh, till near the end of the picture, but he sets everything up, and then we're we're kind of uh, drifting back and forth between these magnificent Irish characters and the uh, the imagery of Ireland that Ford caught on location. Uh, but the, a lot of the plot just kind of gets pushed to the background until you know you're at the one hour point. It's time to start moving along and getting towards the end. You know, but he had a very leisurely. It's very typical of how he worked a lot of the time. Not all the time, but we do that a lot. I'll I think pick that up later when Hawks mm-hmm. transitioned from the fastest director in Hollywood with his girl Friday and bringing up baby and those and became the slowest director in Hollywood with Rio Bravo uh, and Hattari, you know, where you, the picture's droning on for two and a half hours and there is no plot. Really? It, there's a couple sentences of plot. Mostly it's just characters interacting, you know, it's just people. Uh, but I think he got that from Ford. He, I think he looked at Ford's movies like uh, Clementine and The Quiet Man and said, oh, I don't have to jack uh, jack things up quite so fast. I can relax a little bit. Yeah. I think speaking to that, I mean, one of my favorite moments in the film is when um, the, the uh, Grenville Thorndike is saying goodbye and leaving the town, and he says goodnight, sweet prince, to the, uh, to the old soldier. Um, and you just see this expression on Francis Ford's face um, and you don't know anything about that character, but it's just that one singular moment um, that that really stands out in the movie to me. It has nothing at all to do with, with Wyatt Earp or the OK Corral or any of that. No. I always assumed that they were drinking buddies, that in the week or so that Thorndike is there, they just become drinking mm-hmm. buddies, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the old soldier is just bereft that the only guy in town who drink with him is not leaving. <laughs> That's my <laughs> assumption, you know. But, yeah, but you do get a set, there's suddenly this bond, you know, that bonds are created, which is very Fordian. A bond. He was he was magnificent at, at, at uh, giving a sense of community you know, amongst people, amongst uh, the population of the movie. I, I definitely think that that's the strong suit of, of this because, it, it, like you said, even though it, it introduces the narrative and then drops off for 30, 40 minutes or so, uh, it's it, it's still an entertaining movie because, like, you, like you've said, the, the, there's so many characters, there's so many different personalities that it's kind of fun just to live in this town for a few minutes before you have to pick up with the with the rest of the, of the narrative. And it does pick up and it's great, but it is kind of nice just peddling around the saloon and talking to you know talking to random people around town. It's it's so uh, it is so leisurely. Mm-hmm. That's a great group of characters. You know the the, the characters are very well drawn. The dialogue is excellent. The acting is excellent. And the photography is uh, beyond the criticism, frankly. And Joe McDonald was a Fox contract guy for 30 odd years. You know, he was a, he was at Fox forever. He, he, I just, he shot the sand pebbles for Robert Wise in what was it, 1970, 69 or 70. So he was just around Fox and he was a good, solid cameraman. But he was never a great cameraman. But I mean, my darling Clementine is gorgeously shot. Uh, those, those, those deep focus shots in the bar and, uh, the, the mist hanging in those, those exteriors, you know, uh, and the rain, uh, at the beginning of the picture, the heavy the downpour at the beginning of the picture. There's some stunning images in that movie. And I got, you got to assume that it was Ford who nudged him over the top, you know, to, to, to excel. It, well, it definitely is is different from you know just some of the others I'm thinking of, just, uh, especially the cinematographers that worked with him, whether it was Greg Tolan or Winton Hawk. Uh, you know those they, they all they they brought such a a quintessential you know whatever Western vision, but this one I feel like kind of also sets itself apart from being just a normal. A normal, a normal film because it does incorporate that Monument Valley setting, but uh, like, I mean, I, I, I wish there was a giant, you know, 
wall sized poster I could get of the that final shot when they're riding off and you have the you know the the giant rock fixtures and she's watching him like it's just it's so it's so poetic and it also strikes me as being more um, about faces um, than than you know the the sort of the classic monument valley sort of you know it's it doesn't even really feel a lot of the times like it's about the the landscape itself even though it is um, so rooted in tombstone I mean like one of the other really stunning images in the film for me is um, after Doc Holliday operates on Chihuahua and you just have the shot reverse shot between them and they're both of their faces are so gorgeously lit um, and just like the contrast in those images is just absolutely beautiful. Um, well, with Ford at his best, you get a sense of repose. Mm-hmm. You know, you really get a sense of repose. It's not leisure exactly, because there's always something going. There's a character is going, or there's always something. He never drops the thread entirely. But what you get is a sense of lives being lived, a kind of day, a sense of dailiness about it. Whether it's the Grapes of Wrath or My Darling Clementine, totally disparate genres uh, and 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 different stories. But you really get a sense of the dailiness of lives mm-hmm. and of the and of the uh, the rhythm of the lives of the characters, and that's something very smooth yet they, they, because it's not it's not what people go to movies for. People go to movies to uh, for a story basically, or to see a star that they like. Yet generally, they go for a story these days. Uh, something will take them out of themselves, uh, and Ford takes you away from yourself, but he puts you into other characters, other people, other times, and you really get a sense of how those people live their lives. And, and I love that about him. I love that sense of the tide, the tidal wave, the tide comes in, the tide goes out, you know, the, the things like the church, uh, the church opening and Granville Thorndike coming to town, that eminent tragedy in Granville Thorndike, yeah. the dailiness of life, and, and, and the little peaks that, that separate the dailiness of life. It's a fascinating way of looking at the world. Well, I, I mean, I was, I was kind of saving this question for later, but I think it kind of ties into what we're talking about. And I, I, just a, a point that I've heard made a, a lot around um, just film in general today in terms of studio films is kind of comparing the studio system at this point in time and the consistent outpour of a specific genre uh kind of in comparison to superhero movies today and how they are just kind of coming out at this rapid pace. And it's kind of tough to keep up and and really distinguish what's, what's, you know, what's good and what's not good. Um, I mean, do you, what do you make of that comparison of superhero movies today to Westerns during that era? Do you, is that, is that something that we can, that we can, you know, make a point of, or is that just all, you know, baloney? (laughs) I, I think I think I think the modern movie industry is just 180 degrees away from the industry of Daryl Zanuck and John Ford of 1946. I don't think there's any 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 overlap really, other than the idea of uh, of uh, stardom itself as a as a uh, magnet to draw people to theaters. Uh, but it's just. <clears throat> What the modern movie industry has done is essentially try to take the risk out of making movies, especially in the last five to ten years, when basically they make one kind of movie over and over again, because that's what seems to be the most successful, uh, until it isn't. And at that point, I imagine they're going to have some serious problems with panic, because I don't know if they're going to know how to make any other kind of movie, you know, because it's been a long time, but they've just been making one kind of movie, you know, where planets blow up, those those movies. Um <laughs> And the, they're just taking the risk out of the movie business, and the and risk is part and parcel of the movie business as it was practiced for seventy five, well, for eighty or ninety years, really. I mean, my darling Clementine made a little money. It was no big smash hit, you know. It might have turned it might have turned over a hundred, hundred fifty thousand dollar profit, maybe, maybe. But it was no, it, it, it was not a huge hit. It's never stopped running like most of Ford's films. Grapes of Wrath broke even. You know, and they and and, and Zanuck knew that going in because a lot of people who want to see that that's not what people go to the movies for. People go to the movies to escape that, you know, to escape that kind of reality. Uh, but he made it anyway. There's a story when William Wellman went to see went to pitch uh, the Oxbow incident to Zanuck, and they had a fight earlier on a camping trip. 
because they were Warner Brothers at that point and they were friendly at that point. They went on a camping trip and they got into a fight and they slugged each other. So they hadn't spoken since. <laughs> and, he, and, and Wellman had gone to every studio in town trying to sell the Oxbow Incident, a movie about a lynching. And nobody wanted to make a movie about a lynching. You know, MGM had made Fury for, with Fritz Lang in 1936. That was their lynching movie. They were fine with that. But he didn't need to make one every year, you know. Anyway, no one wanted to make it. Every studio turned it down. So finally, he's got nothing left to do but go to Zanuck at Fox, even though they weren't speaking. So he goes and sees Zanuck, and he outlines the script, and the, I've got the property, and here's what I'm going to do, and here's how I want to shoot it, and blah, 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 blah. And he stops, finally, having made his pitch, and Zanuck looks out the window and sighs and says, it's not going to make a dime, but I want my name on it. And then he said, you can make it on a low budget, and you've got to make two pictures I choose in addition. Well, that's a tough deal, but Wellman took it because he was so hipped on the idea of making the Oxbow Incident that he directed two pictures of Jan Zanuck's choosing in addition to the Oxbow Incident. But Zanuck's basic point, it's not going to make a dime, but I want my name on it. Well, who does that today? Does, it, does, it, does anybody running Paramount do that today? Mm -hmm. Really? Or, 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 or Fox? Or Warner's? I don't see it. There are passion projects that get made, but they're not released by Warner Brothers or Paramount or, or Fox, you know, or Disney. All Disney does is service their franchises. Between Lucasfilm and, and uh, Marvel and Pixar, there's, that's all the juice, that's all the creative juice you got. Disney hardly does anything else. Or remaking their cartoons with live action. You know, that's it. That's it. <laughs> and, and, and you're remaking a, you're remaking a cartoon that's already been successful. All the, all the problems have been solved. You know, you know, the story works, you know, the characters work. What else is there? So they take, they try to take the risk out of movie making and the, and the guys that I'm right about live with the risk. And they were, they were stimulated by that risk because they were all gamblers, literally metaphorically and psychologically. Well, that's, that, that kind of uh, reminds me of a question that we, we t asked, during our episode a couple weeks back about Sherlock Jr. and Buster Keaton. And our guest that week was telling us, was just kind of talking about Keaton and his process and and what the risks that he took just during filming, both physically and and behind the camera to, to make it feel like something that was that was surreal and that was different. Um, so I guess my question is, you know, kind of continuing on this point, what, what are some of these lessons that you feel like modern filmmakers, these people who are making these studio movies, should kind of take take from watching John Ford movies what what how, you know how he tackles character or narrative or action like what what should they be studying rather than just kind of appreciating the searchers or appreciating stagecoach character is more important than plot every plot's been done every plot has been done there are no uh, every plot's been done what sets things apart are characters and you you've got to trust your characters and very few filmmakers really trust characters. Even Christopher Nolan, who wants to be Stanley Kubrick and isn't. Uh, <laughs> Dunkirk, for instance. What exactly did the weird time frame do for the film? Did it pay off in any psychological way or a meaningful way? I don't really think it did. It, it, once you got it, you got it, but I don't see, it just struck me as a meaningless affectation. And he really didn't do much with characters. He didn't do anything with characters. The characters were kind of ciphers. You know, the scale was impressive. The shots are nice. He does shots very well, but uh, he, 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 there's a formality to it. And I mean, what drove me up the wall was he's so perverse. He is so perverse. For instance, there were like 800 boats at Dunkirk ferrying guys off the beach and getting them back to England. Right. He never gives you the wide shot. You never get the wide shot of these 800 boats in the English channel. Why? It's not that he doesn't have the money. He could do the shot, but he never gives you the shot. Did he think it was too much of a Spielberg shot? <laughs> it's just perverse. It was, I, he's a very strange guy. Um, you know, it's like he wants to deny the audience a real sense of scale and keep everything on a, a, a you know, a, almost on a Jack Webb, the just the facts man basis. But it was a huge, huge uh, 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 event. And it required a lot of people. And he never, you never get a sense of that. You get a sense of a dozen people. <laughs> you know? and I, I can't imagine that Ford or Hawks would have directed that story that way. 
Now I realize there's 60 or 70 years have gone by and, and times change and, and, and filmmaking change, but I don't think, I think that was a real, he's just a strange guy. It seems to me to direct the way he directs and deny the audience the pleasures of movie going, you know, which it seems mm -hmm. to me he does almost like a, a, a overly strict father coming home and wanting the kids to clean his plate. And if they don't clean the plate, they got to sit there until they clean their plate. <laughs> anyway, that's my, that's he stands in for a lot of what, what strikes me as bizarre about modern films. No, I, no, I, I totally agree because, um, I, I think that the, the character is, is, is important because I think a lot of the uh, what you would want to call complex um, studio filmmaking at this point is more it kind of threads that line of, of trying to be more of a puzzle box like the 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 whatever your whatever emotion you're supposed to glean from it comes from the intricacy of how they've constructed this plot and how you're able to solve it and it's more of like a you know some sort of you know mental exercise rather than just experience experiencing these these characters and their emotions and and what they're going through it, it's it's much more of like a you know a thinking exercise and i and i feel like nolan is 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 you know of course a big culprit of that but it's also just something that i, I you know you notice on a lot of the big movies that people like to rave about is that it it it's more it's just kind of you know constricting your mind more than than actually engaging with you on a on a narrative level yeah 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 uh but you, the the idea is to experience the emotions as the characters experience the emotions too you know where you where you where you build an identity identification with the characters that's it seems to me is 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 which a filmmaker or any artist is going for, whether it's a novelist or a filmmaker, you know, if, if you're, if you're working for emotional identification and I think Ford was, I think that was, uh, I think that was an, a part of what Ford was about was emotional identification. You know, he wanted us to feel a doc Holliday's self-loathing and contempt for himself. And he wanted us to feel, uh, that strange, slow interest in the, the why it gets for Clementine, you know, uh, even though she's played and written rather blankly, you know, uh, he can still get the idea across because he's great with a camera and he's great with fond of space. It's been a it's been a number of years since the Ford book came out, and I'm sure you revisited the movie for for your uh, Fonda book. But um, I, I mean, just just you know, from the from the time when you were researching Print the Legend uh, to now, do, do, had, has anything changed in your perception of the movie? Have you picked up on anything? Have is that has anything really stuck out to you in in your most recent watching of the of the film than when you were researching it? You know, in, in 1998, 1999. Um, I like it more than I used to. Uh, I would put it as my, actually, and probably we'll write up with the researchers as my favorite Ford, uh, favorite Ford Western. Uh, and I didn't used to because films don't change, you change. And as you get older, you see things that you didn't see before, or you simply appreciate things that you didn't appreciate before. And I appreciate Clementine, I think more than I did when I was uh, 30 or 40 years younger. Uh, because of his control, because of what, what I call it, sense of repose. He's absolutely sure of what he's doing. There's no, you, you get a sense, uh, like I said, of one of the characters stepping behind the camera and making the movie. The guy making the movie seems to be as terse and as in control as why it is. And that's, that, that, synchroni that sense of synchronicity of, of unity between uh, the filmmaker's intent and the character's intent is so rare and it's so beautiful. Uh, and I, I, I just appreciate it more than I used to. Uh, so I would, I, it's considerably higher in my estimation now uh, than it ever was before. I don't know how I'll feel in 20 years, assuming I'm still alive, but right now <laughs> I, would, I would put it, I would put it at the top of uh, top of four's achievements. Uh, Nathan, did you have any questions before we wrap up? No, I don't think so. Other than uh, I, I would put it up there for for me too. I think it's an outstanding. I mean, one of the few perfect American movies. I think, um, but yeah, those El Greco skies. You know, <laughs> those great characters and El Greco skies. <laughs> well, Scott, thank you so much for for coming on and chatting with us. 
Happy to do it, Zach. Anytime. <laughs> well, I, I'll plug. I'll plug both of you, the the books. Uh, Print the Legend: The Life and Times of John Ford is out both on hardback and, and paperback. But the new one, Hank and Jim: The Fifty Year Friendship of James Stewart and Henry Fonda, is out there, and I would recommend both of them. They're both great books. And that will wrap up this episode of Cinematary. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash cinematary, on Twitter at handle at cinematary, and on Letterboxd at letterboxd.com slash cinematary, where we post all of the movies that we talked about in this episode. Next week, we will be joined by another guest to talk about 1949 Stray Dog. This is the first time that the Cinematary podcast has taken on Akira Kurosawa. So we brought on an expert, uh, Professor Stephen Prince from Virginia Tech University, is joining the podcast for next week. Uh, he wrote the book The Warrior Cinema, which is a kind of overarching look at Kurosawa's career. And we talk about Stray Dog and, you know, some some of what makes him such a a monumental director and, and, and one that it's, I guess it's taken us too long to reckon with. Um, but it's a great chat. chat. Def- definitely check that one out. All right. Thanks again, everybody, for listening. I wanted to take one final moment to remind you to check out Audible and get a free 30-day free trial just for being a listener of Cinematary. You can start your trial by going to www.audibletrial.com slash cinematary and picking through over 180,000 titles that can be accessed from your iPhone, your Android, your Kindle, or even your MP3 player. Again, that link is www.audibletrial.com slash cinematary. See you next week.